Welcome back to an episode of the Debrief Competition Climbing YouTube show. It uh, it might feel like we were just here <laughs> because uh, we uploaded our Salt Lake City recap about 24 hours ago. But uh, hey, there's a lot of World Cup action to talk about, so we're back at it. Today we are talking about the Brixen World Cup, which recently concluded and seems to be something of a fan favorite, judging by a lot of the social media chatter. So we will get into that momentarily. I feel like we're going to have nothing to talk about if, if everything was good. That's the problem with these great comps is that they're <laughs> awesome and there's nothing to complain about, right? That's right. Yeah, we'll see. But uh, first, some brief introductions here. Of course, I'm, I'm John Bergman taking over the opening duties for today, giving Tyler a little break. But obviously, I am joined by Tyler, the usual host for this, and the creator of Plastic Weekly. He is, let's see, is that the right direction? Yeah, there we go. Ty, two two so over, two this Tyler. Way, me. And, and our guest today not only runs a YouTube channel of his own, Beta Route Setting, but he was also pres present in Brixen for this World Cup. So we are very excited and anxious to get some insider info on what it was like on the ground there. He is Mr. Nicholas Vishman. Nicholas, good to see you here. Uh, really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, thank you for the uh, invitation, even though I didn't have to leave my place. That's like <laughs> that's... My, my, my favorite invitation to go somewhere. Yeah, that's how it works, right? Um, so real briefly, if you've never seen the show before, we start with a, the big takeaway. We call it the big headline, and then we will each give the highs and lows. We call it the winners and losers segment. So our guest typically goes first. So with that, Nicholas, you were there in Brixen. You you soaked it all in in person. What was your big headline? My big headline is Brixen. Lucky accident or the future of a uh, possible future of a World Cup destination? And you want me to elaborate? I think yeah. so, right? Yeah, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> please. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, Brixen was just a... Uh, uh, wasn't planned. So one of the was it uh, was it one of the China World Cups which got cancelled. Uh, I don't even I think remember. This was the anymore. Moscow one, I think. Right? Am I wrong? Moscow. Yeah. Could, like one of the uh, World Cups were cancelled, and Brixen just jumped in, was volunteering, and Brixen for the guys who have never been to Brixen, you should go. It has. It feels like a like a like a fusion, like like a mix of Innsbruck. And Arco, so it has like this beautiful vibe of La Dolce Vita, like it's surrounded by beautiful mountain sceneries. It's really tiny, just twenty six thousand citizens living there. So it was there Sunday till Monday, so eight days, and um, it's multilingual, multilingual, uh, Italian, German, English. Uh, they speak it. Uh, they are used to tourists. It has an old uh, tradition with climbing, and the outside venue is just amazing and they pulled off like an amazing show so whenever you were walking through the city you were, you were able to see and meet climbers like an Arco or a little bit like Innsbruck but the show itself was just the venue the outdoor wall was beautiful uh, I think the only thing I could criticize is that the slab sections were only on the side panels so there wasn't any really slabby section to set for the finals or semi-finals but what the team pulled off for the first World Cup, they had a, what do you call it, like a, a, a artificial like stairs, like a tribune, like what do you call it, like the, the uh, where people sit and watch. Oh yeah, like a, a, a tiered seating or, uh, or bleachers kind of, but yeah. Yeah, tiered seating and uh, the whole, uh, everything was designed like a, like a Roman antique amphitheater. So there was a stage and then what, like there was a pit for all the judges, so there were, most of them were not in the way of the camera or the spectators. And uh, so it was really easy to see. Uh, and that's like the whole week, the vibe was great. The after party was great. All of the athletes loved it. Uh, the root setting team loved it. I loved it. But just like to be there felt perfect. And especially with the, how the competition turned out over three days, I think this should be one of the future venues if the IFSC would not like to change venues to bigger sizes. I don't know whether you discussed this already, but Meiring, for example, 
uh, is more or less cancelled because the IFRC wants to move with their competitions into city centers and whatsoever. Yeah, I, I I think that's one of the most interesting questions. Is is aside from like you're exactly right, Brixen is in this area. I don't know. Is uh, it's still like the uh, what Alto Adige or like Sud Tyrol, whatever uh, that kind of region of Italy where it does have like a lot of German or Austrian history. I don't know what you would call it, but yeah, um, it's hosted so they, many. Uh, they speak both uh, languages fluently. Yeah, Let's put yeah, this yeah. Um, it it has there's so many historical competitions that have been in that region it is a mountain area it's full of mountain sports in the first place so like it does it's one of those native climbing areas where it just makes a ton of sense um the the people that live there are behind the sport um but yeah that question of, of you know it's it is a small town um it's not you know i i don't want to pretend salt lake city is some like world city kind of thing it's a it's a it's kind of a big city but uh yeah that's the that's the part that bothers me is is a town a town like Brixen has an excellent audience, although it might be small. Uh, the weather was great. You know, it's funny how you mentioned the outdoor seating and environment was excellent because Salt Lake City kind of demonstrated the worst of that uh, uh, of that option. Um, but it is it, it is a shame to think that these aren't the kind of venues we want because of like exposure or whatever. Because it you know they I they want these events in big cities just so that more people or or you know more people can see it or there's the prestige of of being in a in a big town and it's a shame because all my favorite world cups have been in small places where you pack the available seating so it looks full even if it's only like hundreds of competitors rather than a thousand or whatever um the the, the crowd is loud everybody knows what's going on it it frankly feels better and so it's a shame that this might not be one of the places that the ifsc looks at for uh, for an international comp it's uh, it's a bummer Maybe they will in the future. Uh, nothing set, set in stone, but like it feels to me they want to move to bigger venues. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same point, you cannot really upscale climbing competitions. Like uh, if you get more than, if you stand further away than 100 meters, then probably even than 60 meters, like you have to look at the screen, and then mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense anymore. Then it's just like about the vibe, but not about the like the the live action. Yeah. So uh, in my opinion, climbing. The way it is right now, or bouldering at least, is not a sport which you can upscale up to a fully stadium. Yeah. N Nicholas, you since you are a route setter, I'm interested to get your take on this because we've Tyler and I have kind of talked about this in the past. How <clears throat> the the viewing experience as the competition gets larger in scale and there are more and more spectators and stuff how that might influence the route setting could i i, I want to get your take if you think it it would or it should in the sense of if you do have ten thousand people or something like if people are going to be standing way back in the crowd are the route setters going to take that into account do you think or would you as a route setter and say hey we have to make some kind of extra flashy moves here so those people that are even way back can see this no it's not about the distance. It's more or less about one of the problems, for example, was was like uh, same same but different to Meiringen. Uh, the competition was split into three days, and you only have one category of semifinals on the wall at the same time. So uh, for the final bowlers, you're kind of maybe used to it, but also not for the final bowlers. It makes it way easier if you have like eight bowlers at the same time at the wall uh, to to fill the wall. Otherwise, sometimes you have bowlers which just look a little bit more skeleton draft you like uh, but they were never talking about um, consciously about make it spectacular for the for broadcasting television or, or for people who are, who are far way back take a look at boulder final boulder two in the male final which was like huge black uh, plywood volumes but also black holes on the plywood volumes yeah yeah this one and uh, yeah if you're a father back you cannot see what like wh where the where the gripping options are right with the dual text right so that was never uh n never mentioned once hmm. interesting yeah I, I i really enjoyed the event i'm going to talk about that more but uh it's um i think just the conversation of of what kind of cities we have hosting these events in the future is going to be really interesting to see because i i think there's something more impressive about filling a venue like this in a town that really loves climbing versus going to Pick, pick your favorite big city, drop it in a park and have an audience that does not look that 
filling of whatever your your space is you know you just have people towards the front and then empty space in the back that that looks sadder than than having a small but proper venue like this the the, the I, I think this is the the better way forward so yeah not mm -hmm. that not that they're listening to any of our advice necessarily but it would be uh it would be nice and i think was what was also good sorry john to just elaborate on one more point is that they split it into three days and you, made it you like easy. that that's where you prefer. Uh, i like that mm -hmm. because uh okay you gotta gotta consider my position i'm really bored of climbing competitions climbing competitions i watch them like for, i grew up with climbing and i think climbing competitions are the format which is running right now it it works but it would never be my favorite thing to watch i wouldn't like spend any of my free weekends to go to a climbing competition whatsoever and uh but with a like especially in salt lake after the first first weekend i was only there for the first weekend and after the male final i was already i was exhausted i was like okay i want to go home now just like i couldn't take like possible like 72 minutes more of uh, the next round it was also pretty windy uh they closed down the beer booth everything was just like what's going on here like yeah. four hours in a row just sitting there and just like nah i can't take it so i think splitting it into separate days is just better even without the weather i i completely sympathize with that like when you have a back-to-back -back finals the second final i always find way more difficult to pay attention it's way harder to remember in the future one thing i noticed mm -hmm. just because i kind of right now trying to cover the world cups i do try to watch all the semifinals and finals live and it is just more material if i have to watch four streams rather than <laughs> two so for for yeah. my personal experience i understand most people don't watch semifinals and that's completely reasonable um so i feel it's harder for me but i do think it is a better breakup to get one really good concise event on the saturday one on the sunday i think uh for for pretty much all viewers it is a better experience um yeah just more more time for me but that's okay yeah <laughs> i agree yeah i i just would hop on there i i like it this way um that's kind of what i always feel with the the sad thing about speed is if you also have a speed competition or a speed discipline happening as well you have the speed final and then in this case you would have like one day then would be the bouldering one of the dis the divisions finals and then the next day would be the other divisions finals so speed feels so long ago by the end of it you kind of feel bad for the speed uh podium because you feel like they kind of get shafted just pushed back in your memory so far but you know what are you going to do unless you have uh every discipline having a, a separate weekend worth of of mm -hmm. competitions. I don't know if there's any solution. Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, Tyler, what's your headline? My headline for this one is that I think the the world's best boulderers got the final of their dreams. You know, we we talked about last uh, uh, the last couple comps where uh, it was about flashes. It was about, you know, if you gave up a single top or a single flash that put you in a bad place. Uh, these finals were excellent and it really stiffened up and it was a lot of fun. Uh, the women's was kind of interesting because the top two competitors, uh, uh, Natalia and Hannah, of course, topped all the problems and, and with a couple flashes each. So it was still tight for them, but the rest of the field showed how difficult those problems were. It, it gave us a little bit more context rather than having a lot of flashes and a lot of tops through the entire set of six women. Um, but the, and uh, let me, and I'll talk about the men's setting first. Men's was excellent because the first boulder was the uh, the perfect kind of climb where everybody tops, but you get this excellent separation on attempts and you get to see climbers work through all the moves and you get to see progress for each climber, which is what you what makes it exciting for me is can this guy get it done in the time allotted? And in this case, all of them did, which was an awesome start. Uh, and then, of course, the men stiffened up dramatically, ended up just two guys trading tops back and forth, which for the storyline for both men's and women's was excellent because we had that top spot shifting back and forth as the competition went. And it came down to the final boulder and in a women's case, the final climber uh, being what decided the winner. Um, I don't think competitors feel bad at all when it's a low top final. I think the ones that won or earned medals feel like they deserved it in that case they had to fight really hard i think all of them felt like they had to give it their all to earn the position that they got 
Um, I don't think the competitors in the lower end of that finals field can say, well, everybody was just topping so much stuff that the margins were so narrow that, you know, I just accidentally by fluke ended up at the bottom. No, you, you simply didn't top as much as the other guys, right? This was an earned final, whatever medals you got, uh, uh, you worked for it. So I'm guessing all the climbers felt really, really satisfied. And same thing for the viewers. Uh, the the competition was actually exciting to watch. Part of that's about the route setting, but part of it is just the the luck and the happenstance that it went down to the final climbers and the final boulders, which in a sport like ours is not a given. There's some comps where the comp is over before you get to problem number four. And it's just reality with the format that we use. It's We could change the format if we wanted to, but we probably won't. Um, but... This was one of those satisfying finals, particularly women's, where it was uh, it came down to that final attempt. And that is such a satisfying experience for any sport. So especially for the climbers, but also for the audience, this was uh, possibly the, the boulder comp of the year so far. It probably, I think, in my opinion. Nicholas, do you have, um, well, you're welcome to speak on any of that, but I am curious to also hear kind of if you had a favorite a, a favorite boulder kind of one that the setting stands out but um... first i want to say like yeah thank you for the elaboration i think I, because i'm uh, emotionally attached to this whole composition because i was <laughs> there like helping or like like first filming the whole setting process and at some point like becoming like part of the crew like spending like seven days with them so i'm emotionally attached and i feel like yeah that was a pretty pretty dope comp and um, what you said about like world's best bowlers get the finals of their dreams that is a really good discussion whether the women final actually was a uh, final of their dreams uh, because i heard some voices especially just, uh, just a few and there's no right or wrong there's just personal opinion that there should have been probably a bowler which would be able to set Natalia apart or like at least to challenge those two to um, or the two best to see who actually is the stronger climber, mm -hmm. the really better climber. Uh, because now it came down to attempts, uh, maybe pressure, maybe experience, maybe maybe luck, maybe you never know. Um, but it's just climbing and it's totally fi fine. And there's nowhere written in the rules uh, what kind of final the setters have to provide. A lot of people have their own opinions and they say, oh, setters did this, setters did that, that comp suck, blah, 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 blah. But it's all about creating a ranking and don't kill anyone. And I think it's not even written in the, in the, in the, in the rules provide a, a show. Like it doesn't say anywhere like make it, make it exciting, <laughs> you know? It's just about like yeah. create a ranking and as and as soon as you have your semi-final and everything is right, uh, I get it, or I would understand it if a lot of setters would be like, okay, we got a safe ranking, which is weird going back to semi-finals, but now make it a little bit uh, softer so uh, we don't have to gamble at all. So I like the really difficult boulders and uh, the setters wanted to create difficult challenges. And in the end, it was maybe for the women slightly less difficult or challenging than for the male competitors. But on the other hand, if you put like one bowler onto the wall, which is just like far out there, it's a gamble if someone climbs it at all. And then you're ending up with three bowler problems on the wall, which get topped and one not. So you have only three for separation. Uh, let me let me let me ask you uh, from this angle then, because uh, like Hannah and, and Natalia climbed all four. Um, uh, Jilu, who came out of nowhere and is not somebody that you could really predict how she might perform, uh, it came third. So I don't, I don't think it was really the root setter's job to try and figure out how that kind of competitor is going to climb. But Miho mm -hmm. Nanaka came away with with a single top, just wasn't fingering stuff out past the zones. And I think uh, to me that feels like kind of a, a um, uh, not a justification, but kind of balances out the comment you're making about maybe there needing to be a more difficult problem because Miho yeah. has a better track record than Hana does. Uh, and yeah. Miho found these boulders too hard to top in three of the cases where Hannah topped them very quickly. Uh, so I feel like it wasn't that far off. And while I agree that, yeah, there was probably room, you know, it, the, it, the comp came down to attempts to zone for between the, the two, the two, uh, the two girls. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but I mean, when you look at how Miho performed, you have to say, well, that's got to be about right in that case. If you have somebody so strong who didn't make much progress at all past zone, I should say she did get close. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally right. Already. Like, I, I, I guess consider, consider, saying, if you consider the levels, the if you, if you take a look more. at it, it's already like she, there's a big step between like Natalia yeah. and Miho in this competition. Mm -hmm. Just saying there were like those opinions and this opinions. And I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a good competition because we were seeing like two slightly different kind of finals, but both exciting, which was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. And you asked about my favorite bowler? Uh, probably male four, hmm. because it went through mm, a few changes, uh, but it was really spectacular and uh, the testing process was cool because that jump was like really, really difficult. And uh, just a good bowler, like jump, to hook, another dynamic movement, but a different kind of type. And then we goes into the slapping phase where you have to find the crimp uh, on top of the huge ball and then go to the top. So it's like really compromised. You were able to do many tries if you wanted to. Uh, which was still hard, and but bowler number two was also pretty cool in the mail round. Ah, I can't really decide. <laughs> <laughs> bowler, bowler number four got me because anytime there's a big yellow sphere, uh, that, for for some reason any boulders that have a big protruding yellow ball on it to me mean good times. So I was, I was okay. very I was very attracted. It might be like Innsbruck throwbacks from. 2013 sure. or 14, whatever year that was. Uh, I wanted to ask you a bit about the forerunning process then and the crew that you got to work with. So let's talk about those hard moves. Who are the who are the people on the crew that that the team was looking to to give the advice on whether or not this stuff uh, goes for the field? Like, was there a most trusted voice sort of when it came to to those kind of movements for the for the men? Uh, um, that was pretty cool. There were uh, so it was a crew of eight setters marching. I don't even know his last name. Was. From Poland, Pol right? Pol yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Polats. Martin, he was the head setter. Then we had uh, Mathieu de Tre mm -hmm. from uh, France. Uh, and the third IFSC setter was Tsukuru Hori, mm -hmm. the uh, former World Cup climber and B-Pump chief setter. Mm -hmm. Then we had uh, Jeremy uh, Lotau, a French setter. I think he's working at the blockout gyms. And then... Uh, what? The head setter of the gym, Hannes uh, Mantinger, so Italian, Austrian, no, Italian, sorry. And uh, three Italian setters, um, Marco Espamer from Arco, uh, he set already the Youth World Champs in 2019 and many uh, at Karma and whatsoever. So they have uh, their national setters who are there to learn, but also they are super experienced. Uh, already set on European Cups and with Jackie Gudov and Youth World Champs, Ricardo Caprese from Rome, and then Stefan Scarperi, mm -hmm. a really experienced and really strong climber as well. So I hope the others, yeah, the others wouldn't disagree. The strongest physical and technical climbers in uh, those testing rounds were always Tsukuru and uh, Stefan Scarperi. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, when yeah, and those guys were pretty good at communicating, pretty good at guessing the level, which is super difficult. And uh, yeah, especially when it came to ball, uh, male ball on number four. Um, yeah. How was the team vibe with everybody? Fun. It was really fun. I imagine that it would be a little bit more uh, difficult due to the language barrier. But when the uh, when the main language is English and it's not everyone's native language, essentially like no one's, uh, the communication is is pretty simple. Right. Too hard, too too easy. Uh, sometimes it's uh, a little bit more difficult to elaborate why or how. What do you think is hard? But uh, in the end, it worked out and it was really fun. It was really fun. That's awesome. Very cool. Had a good time. Uh, are we in agreement that this was the best comp of the year so far? Uh, I think so. I try not to be emotional attached, but I would say yes, yeah, because it yeah. also looked because it also looked, in my opinion, better than the other competitions. Like Salt Lake, the the climbs didn't look that appealing no. like just like holes and volumes yeah. and also the wall i don't know who designed these walls and painted like this stuff on the wall yeah 
and what was before Salt Lake? Soul. Soul. Yeah. I did. Yeah, I didn't watch that uh, entirely. And Meiringen. Yeah, I think it was, in my opinion, it was the best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it seemed to have all the kind of what I think of as the main three ingredients, right? Which is like great setting, um, great crowd, great atmosphere, whatever you want to call it, and and great drama, or there was a great storyline. I guess when it's an outside venue, there's a fourth factor, which is great weather, mm -hmm. too. But it did just kind of seem like all everything came together for this one. Like I said at the outset here, it seems like everybody on social media was saying this was the best. So just uh, was curious to get our thoughts. It seems to be we're in consensus here that this, you know, they're all kind of special in their own way. But this did feel like it was probably the the best so far on the circuit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, my big headline would be that Germany is back, meaning Team Germany. And, of course, that is anchored by the phenomenal performances of Yannick Flohe and Hannah Moyle. But I, I kind of think it's best, or I would prefer to talk about it more as a collective. That's why I say the team thing, rather than just their individual performances, as great as they were. Because I'm always a little reluctant to to shine a spotlight on an individual competitor after just one great event. The, uh, the stars can align and a competitor can have the, the night of his or her life. And it should be applauded, certainly. I, I don't mean to detract from their individual performances, but putting it in a larger context, context and saying things like, uh, you know, we have new big players in the upper echelon here, or we have uh, new stars being being born and all that. I want more than one competition or more than one final round to inform statements like that. And and so here, kind of going out from all that, we do have multiple competitors, Hannah and Yannick. It just kind of feels like there's some magic being brewed on the German on the German team. And I think this could signify a return to prominence. If if we think back to 2013-ish, 2014-ish, 2015-ish, we had big stars on the German team, multiple stars in the bouldering division specifically, Monica Recchi, Thomas Tophorn, of course, Jan Hoyer and Julie Verm, kind of getting into the finals frequently, if not making podium frequently. It's been a little bit of a drought since then, or at least it feels like it. And that's not to say it is completely dried up. Jan Hoyer had a, a podium in 2019 I think at a World Cup and Yannick had a podium at a World Championship in 2019 but that's kind of been about it and and certainly in the women's division it feels like things have kind of dried up a little bit in terms of German podiums so I, I'm excited for this I, I think maybe the arrows are pointing to this could be the rise of Germans next generation of finalists or podium multi you know team type of thing so we'll see where it goes I, i'm very curious to get nicholas's to see if he has any insight into this on the squad or hannah and yannick specifically i'm just i'm all ears the rise of the german team yeah uh <laughs> yeah are you like skeptical uh, i think <clears throat> uh, uh i honestly I don't think in those categories. It's a little, uh, I have to change my point of view now. Uh, try to think about this. Um, let's put it this way: Hannah and Yannick, they both had it coming, right? So, in my opinion, Hannah consistently made semifinals. She, I think, she had a uh, few times uh, finished in seventh position. Uh, Yannick made finals. Um, so his confidence, like he's a confident dude. That's pretty cool. Like. Um, he's like, what you, in my opinion, need is not only an athlete who is strong and also a good climber, but he's also a personality. He's like bold and outspoken. He's like, yeah, did you see that, guys? That was me, and that was pretty cool. <laughs> so I think that's really necessary for our sport. And um, I think the biggest statement, or like they're both amazing climbers, and the biggest statement what Yannick made uh, in this competitions weekend for me was not only the qualification round which was hard but then the semi-finals he was the only one topping boulder three which was 
nails hard. It was super, super, super hard. And we did not expect him to be the only one topping it. Uh, the feeling was more or less like, okay, this is a really, really difficult crimpy problem. So our crimp masters are, okay, we got Alex Megos, we got Chang Wan Chon, we got uh, uh, Ogata Yoshiyuki, we got, got Narazaki Tomoas, and then Yannick. So we got like probably five guys who are like on the same level. But for him coming out and just destroying this boulder and like showing, okay, guys, like today I'm strong. I'm super, super strong. Um, that was outstanding for me. And I think a uh, really good, just really good moment. And that he kept it all together in the finals because starting last in the finals is not always the easiest. I don't want to go into the discussion whether it's fair or not. It's just the way it is. And I like it. Uh, but then just keeping it all together and just taking his first win was pretty, pretty good. And in a few cases in the past, we have seen that it can be uh, the bottle opener, like that, that uh, just like unleashing the confidence uh, for the rest of the season. The season is almost over uh, for bouldering, right? There's only Innsbruck coming. So, um, yeah, we should do some betting, right? Oh, I'm betting five euros, uh, five, five euros that Yannick will do it again. Uh, and Hannah, she was consistent, like, consistently like rising through the youth as Yannick as well. And then in the last few years, uh, always getting closer and closer. And it's also a huge confidence boost if you go into the finals as well, like in second position. Uh, and maybe it gives her so much confidence to be like, okay, now uh, I see like I'm really close to Natalia. Uh, that's my new goal, maybe catching up. And if you try to catch up, then you always make the finals because Natalia always makes finals. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, like the density of the male field, especially like when it's physically, uh, at the physical level, is way closer together than in the women's field. <sighs> I don't know whether that's true anymore. So what was your question, whether the uh, team is rising? <laughs> well, let me, let me ask yeah, you a question. You, you I hope given, so. You, me... You've given some good info. I, I think what you said, the fact that we have seen Yannick and Hannah kind of rising steadily late, like, you know, semi on the youth scene, first of all, and then in like some semis consistently and stuff. It did not feel like either one of them was this anomaly making it into the finals we weren't we've been we've had situations with other competitors where they make the finals and you're or make a podium and you're kind of like whoa like where did this come from it didn't really feel like that with them it felt like oh this is like a yeah this is like maybe the next point on their steady progression that we've witnessed mm -hmm. and um i mean i you could argue that yannick was was already pretty at a high water mark with that world championship podium but the point is because it did feel like this this end point of a steady progression or at least another waypoint on that steady progression upward that's why i think maybe it's an indication of some more robust long-term success on the german from the german squad in the bouldering that's the one question i wanted to ask uh of you nikki if and i and i, I don't know that you're necessarily involved or super close to this stuff but how do you feel about the, the german team at the moment like it's it's something where we know that they've got depth within semifinals we see a lot of german names frequently in a, in a bouldering semifinals and now these two great medals this weekend do you think that's a reflection of you know yannick and and hannah have both been on the scene and improving over time and and doing lots of semifinals uh, but do you think there is a cultural thing do you think this team is deeper than just these two climbers are you uh, do you have faith in kind of the the german team at the moment for more success I, th I think that those two are a little bit ahead of the rest of the team. Okay. Um, the rest of the team has a lot of potential. Uh, Philip Martin, Afra had like really good results and uh, qualifications and then made it consistently uh, into uh, semis. But this little like notch to make it into the finals about the other competitors. I think Philip Martin made it into maybe lead finals. I don't even remember. Uh, it's really difficult for me to tell because I don't know the other ones that well. I don't like. I've been not part of the German setting team since 2017 when I moved to Australia. Sure. So I, I'm not really deeply connected to them. I know uh, 
they like their their local coach of Yannick and Hanna Fritz is one of my really really good friends. We used to do stunt work together. So they Fritz and uh, so Yannick and Hanna they have uh, a local training center through the west. Not a training center, but they train like uh, around Cologne and. Uh, Bergstation, so like Western part of Germany, and uh, the majority of other athletes comes from Bavaria or either Berlin, and they so so it's not like in Austria where you have like Innsbruck or in Japan where you have B pump. And there was always like the thing I would mm, not criticize, but uh, what uh, I think what would be better if you have like one local center where everyone meets, just increases and pushes the level. Um, but maybe the two new coaches, uh, I don't know Ingo Filzbieser that well, and I also don't know Zagi that well. I just met Zagi, and he's a, he's a really friendly and really funny guy, and he's a setter as well, and he's really motivated. And maybe there was some uh, fun, foundation groundwork uh, laid or like planted over the last few years. It's really difficult to tell about the, the COVID situation as well. Like Without COVID, maybe we would have had like some other athletes, like Philip, Mar Philip Martin was really close to the Olympic qualification. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen some other uh, athletes just like going down, you know, like just going down the hill, like which we are starting before or who couldn't keep their level high. So um, difficult for me to tell. Okay, I, think cool. the, I, I think there was a groundwork uh, already planted. And I think maybe, uh, I, and I hope the new coaches, their mix uh, of different personalities can push the team a little bit higher or more consistently now. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the lead season because lead is suffering. Like lead is totally different kind of sport. In in, so, in Germany specifically, what do you mean by it's suffering? <laughs> just in general, to train for lead, just suffering. Oh, sorry, like, it, to to to, yeah. to to be a lead climber is suffering. Yeah, yeah sorry, to be a, I understand. To be a lead, okay. yeah, sorry, to be a lead climber is gotcha. like. I, I thought suffer. you were saying that Germans, nobody in Germany could lead climb or something like that. Ah, no, okay, sorry. No, 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 okay, no, no, no. I don't what, understand. That's not what I meant. But it, 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 to put in the <laughs> amount of volume of training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, let's talk about winners, I guess. Yeah, Nicholas, what's uh, what's your big winner? Or your your big highlight takeaway from this? Yeah, Brixen. For me, it was just Brixen in, in, in general. Just mm -hmm. w what a great weekend for me. And uh, it was the first time that I asked people on Instagram what they thought about the final. And everyone everyone liked it. Mm -hmm. the majority was like, yeah, that was uh, by far the best final of this season. And other people uh, said it was like the best final they've seen since Meiring 2019. I think that was like the toe catch, uh, the steep part. Uh, yeah, just it, it, it has been fun to see such positive response to this competition. Yeah. I mean, it it it's just it's rare that you go on social media and you get in a good mood, right? Like there's so much yeah, negativity it, on there. Uh, so it has been fun to just read the responses of this comp, and everybody seems to just be giving it two thumbs up, which is a uh, which is great. Yeah, when it's for a person like. I, I know Yannick and Hanna for a long time and really happy and I'm really really happy for them but when it's for a person or like if I have to pick a winner uh, that's Max for me I met him first time uh, uh, 2019 in Arco Youth World Champs and I think what our sport is missing is someone who's like this sport is fucking cool it's super dope you should do it and I want to win like it's like the Muhammad Ali type of like yeah, I'm going to the finals, and when we go to the finals, we're going to rumble, and I will come out on top, you know, like this, a yeah. little, bit, little bit, like, cocky, a little bit confidence, yeah. and I will train hard, I learned hard, but it's not like, oh, I made finals, oh, that was so much fun, and I played sixth position. So, like, yeah, you did, uh, and I would never be in a position to do this, but it's also, like, isn't it, like, your goal to win? Like, what's wrong with you to be happy about, like, in sixth position? You're just like, oh, great time, standing on the mats. Yeah, what the fuck? Like, I don't get that. And I really like that we have someone who's at least like, okay, train hard, play hard, go hard, and have, like, an awesome style as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be max for me, if it, even though the others won. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll have to get Natalie Berry on here at some point because it does feel, as much as we talked about the German team here and we'll kind of keep it focused to them for this episode, I'm glad you mentioned Max Maximilian because it does feel like 
the germ the Great Britain team is is kind of uh, has its own um, new generation surging right now and doing great things, and that's a whole different discussion. But it is worth it is worth stating that. Tyler, anything uh, to add to that, or would you like to give your well? My winner? my winners tie right into that, which is yeah. is talking about Max, talking about Yannick, talking about Jilu, talking about Doyen. It was like this: the the big winners for this event was, and partially because some big names didn't qualify for finals, and partially because a lot of people didn't show up. Uh, which is uh, another talking point on its own. We had a ton of these these young athletes who who are, have all proven to be good, aside from uh, Jilu, who has not proven anything until this weekend, um, at least that we've seen. Um, all of them get to get some face time. They get to be in a finals. They get to climb the boulders. They get to be in the spotlight. Uh, and they had some great success for all of them. Everybody got an upgrade from where they were before, whether it was upgrading from, you know, Yannick's World Championship bronze to his World Cup gold, uh, uh, Max upgrading from a finals to to a uh, to a medal, uh, Doyun from semifinals to finals, uh, Jilu just showing up and and being this incredible. Like I mean, it was it was really hard for me to believe. Uh, um, so that that the stats stuff that I've built for myself. Um, and and a bunch of the data that some people in the Plastic Weekly Discord has ripped uh, only goes back to like 2007. So when we saw her make finals, we're all like racking our brains for like, when was the last time a Chinese athlete made a bouldering finals? And so I was very quick to, to rip through everything from 2007 because it was really just a control F search for CHN, try and find any Chinese athletes, right? Nobody. And so from then it's like, okay, but was there anybody before that? Because there have been Chinese athletes on the scene for a long time, uh, particularly in speed climbing. So I figured, you know, if we go back far enough, there must be, there must be somebody that's made a podium uh, in China and it, it has never happened in bouldering. And so this, this debut out of nowhere, all of a sudden China is, uh, is on the block and they've got a medal in bouldering. And from what we can tell based on coming out of COVID, all of this new Olympic funding, China, of course, being a powerhouse and literally whatever they set their sights on, if they decide that China is going to be a bouldering superpower, give it a couple of years and they will be a bouldering superpower. Uh, it was it was a huge arrival for uh, for this Chinese athlete in particular. And hopefully that's a harbinger of what's to come uh, for the rest of their team. So the entire thing was just killer debuts and finals. And we now have these, you know, four or five athletes, I should say Hana there as well. Obviously, all of them now have that experience and a little bit of extra confidence to say I'm a serious player in this scene. Um, and, and I'm going to walk with a little bit more swagger when I get to Innsbruck and maybe even in the lead season, who knows? So that was my big winner was, uh, uh seeing a lot of young success from these new faces. Just when we think we have this season figured out, right? Like just when we kind of think, okay, here's who like the big names are going to be, here's who are going to be the consistent finalists. Then we get this event where it's just all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this is, it's such a shakeup in the best way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Yeah. Well, so, so I have to add one more point. What I think made Brixen also pretty good is like may, maybe annoying for the competitors, but I've never seen that many kids waiting for <laughs> autographs and stuff like that. That was intense and insane. As soon as the finals finished, there were 50, 60 kids just storming down just into the pit where the athletes were. They were all like from eight to 14 years old. They all had their t-shirts. We were like, hey, Yannick here, Hanna there, Japanese team, please, Americans, pop, 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 pop. Yeah. Like Yannick, Yannick was just like, yeah, he was covered in kids. Like it took him like after the ceremony, like 20 minutes to get out of there. <laughs> it was, it was amazing. That's really yeah. cool. I love that. That's uh, yeah. I, that was that was one of my favorite moments. I think it was Villar last year where where uh, there was a bunch of kids just you know cheering to the side of the stage when Alex Magos came down off the wall, and and that was one of those moments where the camera managed to catch that excitement. Uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. And I, I that's part of the thing I like about small towns is usually there's not much going on in a small town on a weekend. So when you do bring something like the World Cup, everybody's going to be there because what else is going on in Brixen, right? But, but but there was like there was a mother. She was like, "What's going on here? My kid is just climbing, and my kid told me there's a World Cup. And we had to go right. here." So this kid <laughs> was eight years old and took her mother to the competition. Like all like all three days, 
I was like, okay, wait, mom, uh, you have to look uh, watch out for that girl with the black hair or the ponytail. Yeah. Uh, her name is Natalia. She has a USA jersey. When you see her, let me know. Uh, because we are also looking for this blonde guy from Germany. Ah, yeah, there he is. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then uh, mother on the lookout for Natalia. Daughter just running over to Alex. It's like, awesome. okay, Alex, make us give it. <laughs> so there was like, uh, there is something, yeah, there is something coming, like a fan culture probably. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I love it. This is good. I'll jump in here with my winner because I my winner dovetails nicely with with all of this that we're talking about. And my winner is switching a little bit from the competitors and the route setting. My winner is the IFSC's. I don't know if you'd say the IFSC itself or their video production department or their video content creators, the people that are making up the stuff that they that they film, but. This season, we've seen little indications that there's some expansion going on in the type of videos that they're doing, specifically the type of ancillary videos or the shoulder content, if you want to call it that, of the videos. Here in Brixton, specifically, we saw there was a nice tour, as of as beautiful as the venue was. We've been saying this whole episode how great it was. Well, there was a great tour given by Matt Groom of the whole grounds. Then there were some fan fan cam type of clips of some specific flashy moves that got thrown up on the IFSC YouTube page. And then we had like, of course, athlete interviews here and there in the live stream. And then we had the what's in your bag segment with, with Quinn Mason. It just feels like there's a, a, an increase in the amount of those shoulder content videos, the ancillary videos. And I think that's great. Tying it back into here, what we're saying about the fans, fan culture, those videos fuel the fandom because especially since there is, it's such a media thick world right now. The first thing you do when you're getting into anything new, if you are one of those 10 year old kids or 12 year old kids or whatever that's seeking autographs, the first thing they're going to want to do is after the competition is go down the YouTube rabbit hole and also find all these other videos, get to know the competitors themselves through the videos, the personalities. Hey, this is Quinn Mason. What's in her bag? What kind of music is she listening to? You know, on and on and on. And so I just I think it's worth mentioning that uh, that I've noticed that the IFSC is doing that this season. And I I, I love it. Yeah, I've I've kind of aired my gripes about particular segments and and when they're timed. Uh, uh, in the in the previous discussion we had, summary of that is, at the end of a tournament when we're wait or at the end of a competition while we're waiting for the podium, I would like to see content that is more about the winner rather than about, you know, congratulations Yannick Floey on the win. We're about to do the podium now. Let's talk to Quinn Mason who dropped out in 79th place and find out what's in her you know climbing bag. I'm like ah the timing for this isn't perfect, but I, I I do agree that I'm I'm very happy to see them trying to produce a bit more stuff to to limit the amount of downtime in the uh, in the broadcast. I think that is a, a huge step. If this is the only improvement that we're getting after selling our broadcast rights to Eurosport, then to me that's not quite enough. But it is a good start. So I'll take. Take it. I, uh, I'm, I'm certainly on, uh, on board with that. The Eurosport guy, like they, they, the German one, at least he tried hard. Like I walked around <laughs> with him like two days in a row, first day, two hours, second day, one hour drinking Aperol in the morning. Um, he's 69. Drink for, old, that, like... for that region. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like spritzes or whatever they're called that, that drink from yeah. Northern Italy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, okay, I can just talk about the German commentary. Uh, we talked about it and I showed them the women's finals and he was like, yeah, we don't have to talk about it. Like, they don't broadcast the women's finals. And I was like, whoa, okay, that's... Uh, okay, wow. Uh, Sorry, the, so, Ger uh, the German Eurosport was broadcasting the men's, but they didn't do women's? Yeah, not with commentary, apparently. Uh, maybe they showed it after... Uh, like, as I understood him, like, they sh showed it afterwards. Uh, I have to check on it. Maybe they used uh, Matt Grooms and Denon's uh, voiceover. Mm, I think it should be. It would be really good for them. I don't know how we get the message across to Eurosports because they don't care uh, that there should be like a second audio layer and that they should be able to switch between Eurosports uh, local commentator commentators in Europe, German, French, whatever. Uh, to the YouTube, uh, to the IFSC own commentator, commentators. I think we just got to wait until the end of the year. 
and we know <clears throat> and we can see the financial fiscal report of the uh, IFSC until we can see how much money they actually got out of it. I know that they essentially for the stream uh, I walked around with uh, Denon, uh, the co-commentator mm -hmm. of the finals and uh, we talked about the boulders and we also briefly talked about uh, good camera angles to show apparently they were really good at cutting away in uh, the most uh, in the best moments there was some embarrassing I, camera work this weekend I, unfortunately I, I, yeah I, I looked at it when uh, max top boulder number two and it was like okay max full frame position and then cut and then only face was like yes yeah so they want to go for more faces uh uh, it's a bigger discussion, like how much should we as climbers be involved in the development of our sport? No soccer, no football player would ever, would ever think about what the FIFA would do, the NHL, the NBA, about their television rights. I don't want to go into this, but it's like a big thing. It's like a big topic, like how much should climbers be involved in rules, presentation of their sport? Yada yada yada. There's a lot. Yeah, I'm not but, sure. I'm not sure what exactly you, you you mean on that. Like, I if if we're talking about the competitor, when you say climbers, when you mean competitors specifically, um, I don't think competitors. Climbers, we have an we, we have an opinion about it, what we like and what we don't. Right, like. right, right. But, uh, yeah, I, I I don't know. I, uh, I I think we should be very involved because we're the ones buying it for the most part. Um, and I think that's the, I, I'm almost like, I don't even really want to, I am curious to see what the end of year financial statement says. I would love to, to know more about how much money we're making, but I guess my problem mm -hmm. is that amount should mostly be agreed upon when you sign the deal. Right. So I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like this isn't the kind of thing where, Oh, okay. Eurosport will give you the broadcast rights. And then you give us whatever income you made. Like if you only sold five subscriptions, then we'll take, you know, $25 or whatever. That's not how it should work. It should be. They sold it for a certain amount of money and whether that money comes today or comes tomorrow, they agreed on the amount and you can budget for it. And so any improvements to the stream or or any part of the IFSC, whether it's broadcast or sport development or, or events or, or administrative costs, whatever, the improvements should be budgeted in based on the amount that, that was agreed to come from the deal already. It shouldn't be, uh, uh, it shouldn't be, so, like I, I guess the, the deal came so late this broadcast deal came so late that the budget for 2022 is already presumably finished although i can imagine some sport federations not having a an actual budget written out i'm sure that can happen um but yeah i guess what i'm saying is i feel like if if there's benefits coming from selling this uh, broadcast deal we should be seeing them already um yeah that's uh, that's my opinion but bro john broadly yeah i think there there are good signs coming the thing that i noticed about these these little improvements that we're seeing is that they're extremely low cost i don't get the sense that the broadcast team is at the event an extra day early uh, like a day earlier than before to make the content i don't get the sense that there's a significant new investment in extra equipment necessarily um, so i'm i'm trying to figure out what what of this stuff is is because they have this extra money or not um, uh, one well, thing I'll really say, unnecessary guy with the microphone standing on the mat. I don't I, know what I, he's doing. I generally like that. I I do like that if it works. There's sometimes where I'm not sure if that microphone is on because I swear I see the mouths moving, but I don't hear anything come through. But broadly, I want to hear. I like. I want to hear when the athletes curse. I think it's hilarious when Matt Groom has like thinks he has to apologize for what Jakob Schubert just said that came across the mic. That's so funny to me. I'm like, you don't you don't have to apologize, right? Like either don't turn the mic on or just accept it they're adults in sports um but yeah anyway um can i can i go immediately to my uh, big loser because it is the flip side of this um which is uh about the broadcast but specifically about the um uh you can tell i'm too much of a gamer guy because i was going to call it the hud uh but basically the interface right the uh the the scoring uh graphics that we see um the naming graphics and so the two the two spots i'm gonna hit one is it is time that we get first initials on the names of all the climbers uh in salt lake city we had natalia kaluchka and alexandra kaluchka uh racing against each other in some cases but mm. just in the same bracket multiple times and they're both just called kaluchka and that's it so unless you're actually watching it you can't go by the bracket you have to go to the website or to the app to find out what's going on but if you're if you're just watching the stream like a 
normal person, you're, you, <laughs> you have to remember, otherwise it doesn't tell you anything. And of course, the same thing happened this weekend with Tomoe Narasaki and Meichi Narasaki. We just had two Narasakis, a couple points, they were side by side in the scoreboards, and it was just Narasaki, Narasaki, I don't know who's who. That's messed up. It's we gotta we have to be able so to fit one that, more that, letter, that, like that, one more that, letter. Come they on, have, they, they just had the last names. Okay, yeah, didn't, yeah I didn't yeah. know that. And this is this like, has been the yeah. case for like this. I think this current interface and like a uh, uh, style that they have. I think it's what like two or three seasons old. It's it's relatively new. The the design language they have, um, but it is it is time that we add that extra letter to all these names. It would be very helpful, especially right now when we've got a few sibling pairs and maybe more coming up in the next couple of years. Uh, but the other one was this weekend showed how dumb it is not showing attempts to zone on the scoreboard because Nikki, if you haven't been watching a lot of comps, when they show the scoreboard, they show the number. So they've got the little gold boxes, right? So you see the four boxes and it lights up if you have the zone, if you have the zone and if you have the top. But beside that, obviously they have to have the numbers as well. So they have four tops, four zones in five attempts to top, but they do not show attempts to zone. They've just decided that that doesn't mm. need to exist, which I think is hilarious because it's acknowledged in the rule book. It's part of how you break ties, but we just pretend it's not a thing. And in the women's final, <laughs> determining who won the gold medal, it was down to attempts to zone in this case. But you look at the scoreboard and Natalia and Hannah are tied four, four and what, five, four tops each uh, in five or six attempts. And it was down <sighs> to the attempts to zone and we just don't show it. Um, it's time to put that back on the screen, get over, like you're not gonna fix bouldering by ignoring a part of bouldering, right? It doesn't make it easier to understand, it makes it harder. People don't know what's going on. So before you talk, Nikki, it's adding the attempts to zone, but also add some kind of icon that indicates going to count back. Uh, Cause we had that issue last week where, uh, what was it, Yoshiyuki and, um, anyway, top two spots were tied, uh, Anze, Anze uh, Payars. Uh, Yoshiyuki and Anze were tied for first and second, and it went to count back to determine who got the gold medal, and the scoreboard doesn't give you any indication of why. So add first initials, add attempts to zone, and add a count back indicator, because this is just like, we're just pretending the parts of the sport don't exist, and it's dumb. Totally agree. And now I got, because I, I was on the phone with a friend, and he was like, ah, oh, unfortunate, but really unlucky, but it can happen with the women's final that it's a count back to the semifinals. I was like, Hey, there you, you go. Mean, count back yeah. to the semifinals. And now I get it what he yes. thought about because we because he didn't. Yeah, and it I was doesn't like, show you that they were okay. different, differentiated by zones. Yeah, attempts to zone. Sorry. So we talked yesterday, which was Mon No, it was two days ago, Monday. So I was still like really exhausted, and I st still am. And I was like, damn, that was two days ago. Was it really count back? <laughs> or was it attempts to zone? And I didn't go really deep uh, yeah. more into the detail. But now it's like the explanation why you thought. Okay, yeah, totally agree. <laughs> who, who was your uh, big loser for this, Nikki? Uh, I just had everyone who could not participate, which is like uh, Meshdi, because we were looking forward to see Meshdi, Paul Yenf, uh, Orian, and also Manu Kornu, who attended, but Sounds a lot like just the French uh, team in this case. <laughs> yeah, everyone else attended. Like Manu tried to attend, but then he got injured and... Um, uh, Orian and Paul and Meshdi, there were rumors that some of them had uh, COVID. Uh, there were also rumors that they just like stayed at home to concentrate on the uh, lead season. So I don't know, but um, uh, I think they were at some point at the start list. And we looked at the start list and the start list was insane. Mm -hmm. Except for Adam, Andra and Janja, everyone was on the start list. Let's yeah. put it this way. Like was the strongest field of competitors this season. And uh, yeah, like like the setting team was looking forward to see uh, the, all the different other char characters as well. And I think they would have just added more to the show. So um, sorry for those guys to losing out. Otherwise, yeah. uh, because I, I haven't watched the stream of this. Uh, True, yeah. uh, otherwise, may, may, maybe I would have added or like I would have gotten at least like the, uh, the hut thingy. So yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. my no, losers of the I, I'm also it's it was it was too bad because you know now that the cops are back in Europe and we had the kind of this this new success for Mejdi in in America it would have been great for him to have this European homecoming because you talk about you talk about uh, uh, Max Milne being somebody with character and with personality who's so engaging and Mejdi is is 
in my opinion, beyond Max, at least on the stage. Uh, he really wears his heart on his sleeve when he's climbing. And uh, he, he would have been winning over all the hearts of those kids. Uh, it would have been unreal if he uh, if he made it to finals, of course. Um, so, yeah, it is a big... Uh, I haven't heard anything about the COVID stuff at the same time, given that it's they're all from the same team and COVID was rampant in, in the USA. Who knows? Like that, that almost sounds too convenient that it was that it was the French team, but I haven't heard anything. So that is that is like complete speculation. I don't want to uh, I don't yeah. want to suggest that's actually the case. But uh, but yeah, it was it was too bad missing them. I'll, I'll kind of hop in here because my st- standard disclaimer here, I don't like I don't like labeling this the big loser. I don't who I'm about to talk about. I don't think she I don't think it's fair to call her the the loser in this situation because she did come away in 10th place, which is very, very respectable. So she didn't win, though. Right. Here's the thing, though. I I really want Stasha to get to like win a gold medal. I mean, let's talk about a competitor who who wears her heart on her sleeve. Right. Mm -hmm. That is part of why she is so fun to watch. That's why she has so many fans us here among them because she because she she just really shows emotion when you when she's frustrated you know it when she's happy you know it and that's really engaging whenever a, a spectator or a competitor has that quality so here in Brixen I really wanted her to do well and and I kind of thought oh maybe this is her chance to win that gold medal or, or at least get on the podium because if you're looking back through this season Look at some of the people that have narrowly beaten her or gotten ahead of her in the scores, right? Mayringen, Stasha gets sixth place. Who's just a little bit ahead of her? her? Orion Bertone. Okay, and then in Seoul, Stasha gets fourth place, barely misses out on that podium. Who beats her out of those podium spots? Brooke Rabatou in third place, Orion Bertone in second place. Salt Lake City number one, Stasha gets eighth. Who's a little bit ahead of her in the scores? Orion, seventh place. Brooks up there in second place. Uh, Salt Lake City, number two. Stasha gets 11th place. Who's a little bit above her? Orion in eighth, and then Brooks up there in third. So looking at those, kind of thinking about those past results, heading into this competition, I was kind of thinking, oh, well, Orion's not going to be there. Brooke Rabatou is not going to be there. So right away, it's kind of like two of those those people that have proven to be, um, you know, kind of like roadblocks or whatever you want to call in terms of Stasha getting a little bit higher on the results or getting into a podium, they weren't there. So I thought the stars were aligning for this to be Stasha's, Stasha's weekend. Mm -hmm. She has a, and she has a great qualification round too. She ends up with five tops, starts off the semis, fantastic as well. She flashes the first two boulders. So I'm sitting there like, yeah, this is going to be Stasha's weekend. Kind of, you know, she got stymied on the next two boulders in semis um, and didn't, uh, you know, of course, didn't didn't end up making it into finals, finished in 10th. And so I just came away from it feeling so bad for her. I was bummed out because I, I just was really stoked for her. And I I think like all of us here, we want to we want to see her get that get that medal. And um, wasn't yeah. this time. I guess the silver lining is she is having a great season. And and so we'll see what happens for the remainder of it. Nikki, do you have Stasi thoughts? She was not really happy about her uh, about her climbing. I know that <laughs> she's she's rarely happy about her climbing, um, no, or or I, no, sorry about about the competitions. It feels like, but about the competition, yeah, just more in general. Like if you point out like other people who were in front of her, but missing now, that sounds like okay. She needed those people to not to be there to make it, but she. Like she also like she could have done with those people mm-hmm. entering the competition. She just messed up the last ball. Like it, this, it is this, so painful. Problem weird, number four weird, semifinals. Oh. This weird corner, and it, and it was just like Sasha falling down, and then like connection with her father, and her father was just like ah, and Sasha was ah. It was like the whole family was just like <laughs> vibing, and not in a good, not in a good mood, you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no. Uh, I think, yeah, she knows what what was wrong, and uh, I think the consistency she shows up uh, in the season after uh, her injury was in twenty twenty or twenty nineteen, like 2019, with the knee. Yeah. 
I think she's on a good way, and I think yeah, she wasn't happy about this weekend, but uh, all over, I think it's pretty cool. Because uh, in my opinion, it's also pretty difficult to stay consistent uh, with newcomers coming up every season and to stay consist on a si consistent level and still improving over many many years. You gotta remember that, uh, or I think uh, you gotta remember that Stasha is on this or like climbing World Cups for a long time. Uh, I think was it. 17 or 16 when she became European champion after this uh, super final jump with this Janja. Oh, yeah, in Munich? I can't remember yeah, what, what I, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so they're yeah. both around already for a long time. And just looking back, the other athlete being around for that long is Miho. And she's going through ups and downs as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I it, I was saying the same thing, John, at the start of this was look at who's not here. Stasi has never had a better time to improve off her off her bronze. Like so many podium contenders are gone. Um, Stasi is generally somebody that you can probably expect more than half the time to get into finals. Uh, yeah, I I want to. I want to express that I feel like I'm almost exhausted because I, I'm not sure how much more I can stay psyched on Stasia because it seems like she has a very hard time staying psyched on herself when things get difficult. Um, and this is probably one of the easiest comps you're ever going to get in terms of the field to get you through to finals uh, and the next step. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like if Stasia's looking at those final boulders, she would probably be pretty happy to climb on those i think she could have had a decent day on them um and and uh the what's tempering me from from criticizing her performance more is is like how heartbreaking that semifinals four is having your hand on the finish hold readjusting in an entirely stable position right she was not desperate at all she was in a stable position just trying to figure out how to hold this this finish crimp and readjust her body and as she readjusts she pushes herself off the wall and there's only like what 40 30 seconds left it was over and that's what uh what kept her out of uh out of finals so i i um i'm I, I'm feeling like I, I have less and less patience to sing her praises and I'm less and less willing to say that she is a, a future gold medalist in waiting because I feel like I'm just constantly dealing with uh, underperformances. Uh, uh, but I, I'm not going to roast her too hard because it felt like it was just such a heartbreaking comp for her. It was a rough one. Are you saying stuff like this, like, 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 uh, or, you know, like you, 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 you're like trying to evaluate like who's a possible like gold medalist in the future and stuff. Oh, interesting. I, well, I, I think like I, I, it's, it's especially in, in women's climbing, it's pretty rare to win multiple medals and never come away with a gold. Like for the most part, if you can win a bronze or a silver, there's a pretty good chance that at some point you'll win a gold medal. Um, mm -hmm. But Stasia is, is past the first half of her career. Definitely. Uh, the field is getting stronger than it was. Like you, you, you have to say that 2019 season and maybe what 2020 would have been would have been kind of her peak years if uh, if she wasn't uh, if she wasn't injured if uh, if things worked out because I think the field mm -hmm. was kind of weak at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh, I think uh, I'm I'm worried that the window might be closing for uh, for Stasia in in getting something better than bronze. But yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. It's uh, yeah. Well, that's good. Well, uh, I guess unless do any of you have any final thoughts, parting thoughts, any anything else, honorable mention, anything like that? I would do a quick honorable mention, and that's uh, for for biggest losers. Is where's the U.S. men's team at, guys? Where where y'all been? Like since Colin and Myringen? Like did did everybody on the men's team get so traumatized by having to climb that problem three times? They were all like, you know what? Fuck it finals isn't worth it i don't know well, wasn't uh, rosen ross uh, like this tall guy uh in the oh Salt yeah lake yeah ross, ross made finals in salt lake but to me that like that i that's a fluke i don't think he ever makes a finals again in in my opinion so so i think that's cool but the where are the big performers where are the people that you know are, are consistently showing up in semis and finals i don't know i think it's been a weak year for the u.s men's bouldering team you know, that's interesting because I, I don't have the stats here in front of me, but I I was curious about that. So I did crunch some numbers comparing um, semifinalists and finalists from last year to this year. It's it's not actually all that different. Now, granted, Brixen wasn't the best 
event for the U.S. men's squad. But if you look at this season as a whole, for the, like I said, the, like semi-placement and the finals placement, it's not that big, that big of a difference between last year and this year to for the U.S. men. The, the big thing that stands out, though, is last year at this point in the season, the U.S. men had a gold medal in yes. Sean in Sean Bailey winning at Salt Lake City, and also last year, even though it's not part of the World Cup circuit, Nathaniel Coleman gets a medal at the Olympics, which puts this big <clears throat> shine on the men's bouldering or, or the men's squad, I should say. Also, yes. so it's really kind of those two big factors: Sean Bailey's medal last year and Nathaniel Coleman's Olympic medal that that m- make last year seem like light years ahead of this year, maybe in terms of of performance or accolades for the U S men's team. But if people dig into the results, it's, it's really not that, that different. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens, especially in lead season. I'm, I'm, I, uh, I, I, of course I, I want to see great stuff from the, from the American boys. Uh, but yeah, call like for me, it's more Colin and Sean. Um, and, uh, and I think it's been, I think both of them would probably say that it's been a disappointing season for them so far. Um, maybe that changes when the ropes come out. Well, well, you have Colin. He's transitioning to. He's going to college. Graduated from high school, and, and and of course, all of that is happening right around this time of year. That big transition. I don't know him. I don't know if that has played into it, but but maybe just life distractions. Like I said, I don't know. Nathaniel Coleman's been injured. He's been dealing with a finger tweak, so he hasn't been at the last couple of events. So I think those are maybe factoring into some of this. Who knows? Sure. Yeah. Anybody else got an honorable mention? Final topic. Nobody. I'm good. I'm good to go. I guess uh, with that, all that being said, we'll wrap it here. As always, to the listeners, if you enjoyed this show, it might sound small, but it does really help if you click the like button, click the subscribe button, tell any of your friends who like comp climbing about these debriefs and about Plastic Weekly. Um, and also, if you've made it this far in the episode, over an hour into this thing, we want you joining us in the plastic weekly discord it's a cool little community there we love comp climbing we chat about the world cups whenever the world cups are going on so hop in there and and uh, join us of course you can also support plastic weekly through the uh the plastic weekly um patreon we'll put a link of to that below and finally huge thanks for nicholas for coming on the show please go over head to his YouTube channel, Beta Route Setting. Hit the like and subscribe button for him, absolutely. And um, that's about can it. I add, yes, can, please. Can I, add, can I add something? Because uh, just making a little bit of advertisement for my own channel, because yes. yeah. I was in Brixen uh, to cover the whole route setting process. So if you're actual, actually not only interested in what's happening on the stream, but what goes into all the work effort, like all the thinking, the setting, the tweaking, last minute tweaks last second tweaks you've seen a uh, women's boulder number three the final boulder did not resemble uh, the online observation mm-hmm. pictures and if you want to know why this happened and how this happened uh, stay tuned on our beta root setting youtube channel because i will upload long episodes about how all these holes macros and volumes went onto the wall and uh, how the setting team did that and uh yeah, that would be nice uh, to get some feedback. And if you're interested in it. Otherwise, thank you for the invitation here. Uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. And we like comments too, feedback, all that stuff. So leave a comment below, continue the discussion, and we will uh, we'll see you next time for another debrief.